All right, chapter 20, or sorry, chapter 30, American Life in the Roaring Twenties. All right, so in the 1920s, after World War I, after progressivism, after Theodore Roosevelt, big stick policy, speak softly, carry a big stick and you'll go far. After the pandemic, Americans wanted to turn inward and just go back to the way it was in the good old days, like I said in the previous chapter. That's why they picked Harding as president. Um, they were Americans were tired um, of that go get them attitude. They're tired of uh, you know everything that happened in the past 20 years. Um, Americans just want to focus on themselves. And that's what happened in the uh, 1920s. We became in this country, very, very anti-communist, very, very anti-immigrant. And we were into isolationism. We said that World War I getting involved, even though we were the closer and won it out, won, won that war in the end, the amount of lives lost, the um, false claims that we were, everything, we were gonna live happily ever after didn't work out. So Americans said, forget that, we're just gonna party, roaring 20s. Business is gonna kick back up again after being on the outs for 20 years during the uh, progressive period. Uh, big business is gonna reclaim their spot at the top. All right, let's talk about the anti-communist. Uh, there was fear in the United States about communism because of the Bolshevik revolution. In 1917, the Bolshevik Re revolution happened in Russia um, and fear of communism all over the world spread. The, the uh, Bolsheviks were very aggressive. They wanted to spread their communistic ways um, all throughout the world, really. Um, and even a small communist party in the United States started to emerge and then people panicked. Businesses blame communist, communism for strikes. Uh, what big business did, and uh, because big business knows how to, to uh, get what they want, they linked communism with unionism. And here's how they did it. They said, a union is gonna go and, and a union leader uh, will go and, and argue for higher wages. Uh, they would ask for, say, a 20% increase in pay across the board. Big business would say that's very communistic because in a communist country, everybody makes the same amount. A pure communist country, it's never been achieved. Everybody makes the same amount. There's no upper class. There's no lower class. And the government owns all businesses and pays their workers. Um, and, and that's a pure communist economy. This comes out of Marx, Marx's book. And uh, he, he said that if you have that haves and have not situation where you have the upper class and lower class, eventually the lower class is going to rise up against the upper class. It's happened over and over in history. Um, so a pure communist country, a pure communist government will um, pay everyone and uh, there's no lower class, there's also no upper class. So in a capitalist country like the United States, we believe in free enterprise, the ability to be able to go out and get a job and get a better job and make more money and work hard so you could achieve success and make more money the American way. Uh, so we've always been offended by a system that would keep go-getters down, that would uh, give you no incentive to get better, to get bigger, for businesses to grow because everybody's making the same amount of money. We've always been terrified of, of something like that. So we've had some red scares throughout our history, two big ones um, that we'll be talking about. And this is the first one after the Bolshevik revolution in Russia and then their desire to spread communism everywhere um, really uh, made Americans concerned. Was it a legit fear? Eh, probably not. Would it be real reality for that? It, would it be realistic for communism to spread the uh, United States? Yeah, it'd be really 
really difficult for it to spread all over, but um, we sure did think that it was reality then and in the 1950s as well. A. Mitchell Palmer was the Attorney General of the United States, and he was very paranoid about communism. Um, there was a wave of bombings, including one that hit his house by, um, by different groups of people. Um, so it says here, a wave of bombings aimed at public officials, Attorney General Palmer, A. Mitchell Palmer, and his young colleague, J. Edgar Hoover, eventually the head of the FBI, uh, ordered a arrest. More than 5,000 suspected communists and anarchists, many of them aliens, foreigners, were rounded up in raids, often without arrest warrants. Many were beaten and detained. 556 were deported. So Americans were going around and arresting people that they thought might be spreading communistic ideals, idealisms, and uh, they were putting them in jail and deporting many of them. This country became just avidly anti-immigrant during this time. We've gone through periods of history when we have been anti-immigrant, and they usually are during times where immigrant numbers are on the rise, whether it was in the, in the 1830s and 40s when the uh, Irish came in and they were driving down wages, or in the, in the Gilded Age when the Japanese were coming in and the Chinese were coming in and they were passing the Chinese Exclusion Act and the Gentlemen's Agreement, things like that, we've, we've gone through periods. In the 1920s is probably, uh, you know, uh, uh, the high point at that point when it comes to anti-immigrant sentiment throughout the United States. Uh, classic examples are, uh, I have a few of them here, Sacco and Vanzetti, two Italian um, immigrants who came to the United States and they were uh, atheists. They didn't believe in God. They were draft dodgers and they were accused of murder that they may or may not have done. There was no real hard evidence. However, they were put to death by electrocution. And um, people in America, in America, people in Italy also were, were just um, very angry because they didn't feel like there was enough evidence to put them to death. They didn't know for sure if Sacco and Vanzetti committed the crime. So, um, yeah, anti-immigrant feelings throughout, you know, they just you know, pointed the finger at Sacco and Vanzetti and said, you guys did it. They were atheists, they were draft dodgers, they were troublemakers, uh, but they may not have been murderers, but they were put to death anyway. The rise of the KKK, the, the re-rise of the KKK, the first KKK was anti-Black, um, and they were, after the Civil War, during Reconstruction, when the Southerners rose up against the um, African Americans that were controlling things because of Reconstruction, um, they were kept down, and then after the Compromise of 1877, when the Republicans gave up their their stand to help African Americans, uh, the KKK rose up. Now they're going to rise in big cities in the North. Even um, they're a they're a ultra conservative group. They were anti foreign, anti Catholic, anti Black, anti Jewish, anti pacifist, anti communist, anti internationalist, anti revolutionist, anti bootlegger, anti gambling, anti adultery, and anti birth control. They're an ultra conservative group, no doubt about it. They're pro white Anglo Saxon Protestant. So they, uh, they are on the rise. Also, we've talked about quotas limits to the number of immigrants that would come in. The two well-known laws that were passed in the 1920s that all but eliminated immigration were the Emergency Quota Act of 1921 and then followed up by a stricter um, law in 1924 called the Immigration Act of 1924. So the Emergency Quota Act of 21 uh, set a quota or a limit to the number of people that would come in in certain countries. Um, they, you're, they were, it, it was the, said that it was a law, a quota in which newcomers from Europe were restricted at any year to a quota which set, was set at 3% of the people of their nationality who lived in the United States in 1910. So they would take the number of, let's say, Italians in the United States in 1910. And they would take that number, that total number, and and get another number, 3% of that number. And they'd say, we're going to open the door, and we're going to allow this amount in. 
And when that reaches that 3% number, boom, they shut the door for the rest of the year and don't let any more Italians into the following year. Pretty soon they realized that in 1910, there were a lot of Italians in the United States because of new immigration. So they shifted gears and they modified the law. The Immigration Act of 1924 now cut down to 2% of the, of the people of, of the country, say Italy. And then they went back to 1890 when there was less Italians here because new immigration hadn't yet been full swing yet. So there was less Italians in 1890 and they took 2% of a lesser number. So the number of, of people just was really, really restricted. We know about the gentleman's agreement for the Japanese. Um, and I told you this before, but in 1931, the first time and only time in history that more people left the United States then came here. And then, you know, we read about sterilization, the cleansing of society that happened in the 1920s, a really, really conservative period. There is Sacco and Vanzetti right there. Um, KKK marching in Washington, DC. We'll talk later on uh, in this chapter about uh, the birth of a nation which glorified the KKK, which was the first uh, full length epic movie um, in America, uh, America in history, like long, it was like three hours long and it glorified the, um, KKK. It, uh, it made them look like they were heroes when they saved a white woman from being raped by a black man and the KKK came along and saved her. So that made them look heroic, very controversial. A couple anti-immigration cartoons, uh, here on the left side, you've got Lady Liberty here, the Statue of Liberty looking like a, a hotel for immigrants. And then here, uh, an undesirable meaning an immigrant coming in, it says close the gates and it says immigration restrictions. They want to close that gate, ticking time bomb type thing, anti-immigration. This, These two maps show you uh, the difference between the Emergency Quota Act of 21 and then the Immigration Act. So you could see that a lot of people were coming in um, in some different countries. Uh, they set the the 3% uh, from 3% from 1910, and then they shifted it in 24, and they went with 2% of a smaller number. So the, the lighter shades mean less people coming in. So big difference uh, within a three-year period. All right, let's talk prohibition. Prohibition started out as a, as a uh, congressional act called the Volstead Act. It eventually will become the 18th Amendment um, in 1918, and it will outlaw the cons a consumption, sale, distribution, transportation of alcoholic beverages, just totally uh, eliminated alcohol from the United States. Did it do that? Absolutely not. The Roaring Twenties was a time of prohibition, but more people drank during the 1920s than ever. So they were drinking during, during prohibition. And sometimes it was dangerous because they were drinking, you know, li liquor that was, you know, distilled in somebody's bathtub. So it wasn't very scientific, it wasn't very clean. Um, and sometimes they'd get the formulas wrong and the alcohol content would be too high. And you just like drinking rubbing alcohol, you drink rubbing alcohol and it's gonna make you go blind. People were actually going blind during prohibition for drinking alcohol that wasn't prepared correctly. But it was a time um, of speakeasies, which are illegal secret bars, bootlegging, making the distilling of liquor, illegally distilling of liquor. Uh, lax enforcement after a while, you know, the police just said, forget it. We're not going to do anything about it. And it opened the door for gangsters like Al Capone to be able to sell liquor um, on the black market and make a lot of money. The, the thing about prohibition is it's a minority movement. The majority of people were against it. All those immigrants that were coming from Italy and Russia and Germany, where there's a history of, of alcohol consumption in those countries they're against it. Um, it's a weird, it's an anomaly. How did it start? Is it, did it start in the churches? Did it start in the South to control slaves? But it just spread. Uh, they call it a noble experiment, meaning a good try. You know, the, the, a lot of people were doing it for the right reasons. Uh, we're pushing for prohibition. But at the end of the day, America became a nation of lawbreakers. And and because of that, they would eliminate it with the uh, 21st Amendment later on. 
women played a big role in prohibition. The Women's Christian Temperance Union, um, led by Carrie Nation, um, really pushed for it. Women that were, um, men, men were coming home and abusing women. Um, so they played a big role in it. It says here, lips that touch li liquor shall not touch ours. Enforcement, like I said, was pretty lax when they did enforce it. You know, they would make a show of it, but a lot of times they'd put the alcohol in evidence and then the police would have a party and drink the alcohol. Yeah. Uh, Homer Simpson wasn't too happy with prohibition, alcohol prohibited in Springfield. There's Al Capone right there. Um, because of prohibition, the gangs were now had, not only were they selling drugs, but they were also selling alcohol and making a lot of money. Uh, Al Capone known as Scar Scarface uh, he was finally caught. He was uh, caught on tax evasion, not on, uh, not, it wasn't, you know, because of, of bootlegging or anything like that. They caught him for tax evasion. He went to prison and then he died of syphilis in prison. The St. Valentine's Day massacre in 1929 was one of the most well-known killings in uh, gangster history. It says here, Capone's most notorious killing was the St. Valentine's Day massacre. On February 14, 1929, four Capone men entered a garage on Clark Street. The building was the main liquor headquarters of bootlegger George Bugs Moran's Northside Gang. Because two of Capone's men were dressed as police, the seven men in the garage thought it was a police raid. As a result, they dropped their guns and put their hands against the wall. Using two shotguns and two machine guns, the Capone men fired more than 150 bullets into the victims. Six of the seven killed were members of Moran's gang. The seventh was an unlucky friend. Moran, probably the real target, was across the street when Capone's men arrived and stayed away when he saw the police uniforms. As usual, Capone had an alibi. He was in Florida during the massacre. And there I am, shameless self-promotion at the wall. They have the St. Valentine's Day massacre wall located at the Mob Museum in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, you could see the holes in the wall. I don't know if you could see the circles right there uh, where they shot up those men. All right, let's talk about John T. Scopes' trial, um, talking about conservatism in the uh, um, 1920s, very, very conservative. John T. Scopes is a high school teacher in Dayton, Tennessee and he was charged with teaching evolution. He would, you know, normally at this point, they were teaching Adam and Eve and uh, creationism, like, and, but then there were a few that were beginning to come around on this idea of Darwin and evolution. But there were still a lot of conservative people that said that we, there's no way that we could have evolved from monkeys. So they called it the monkey trial. William Jennings Bryan was among those who were against him because he was super religious. But the one time boy orator, William Jennings Bryan, was made to sound foolish and childish by expert attorney Clarence Darrow, who uh, defended John Scopes. Um, the trial proved to be inconclusive. Uh, he. Uh, John T. Scopes was found to be guilty of teaching uh, evolution, and he was fined a small amount of money. Uh, but it just shows you that, that there's the conservatism still is, was big. It's, it's still big today. There's still schools in the Deep South that refuse to teach evolution. They talk about they're super religious, and they talk about uh, uh, Evolution is only a theory and Adam and Eve and creationism, they still teach it. Uh, it says here, increased numbers of Christians were starting to reconcile their differences between religion and the findings of modern science, right? Modern science being, you know, hey, Darwin came out and then practically has proven that evolution is a fact. So it was this fundamentalist who believed the Bible, everything in the Bible was true, like Adam and Eve, versus a modernist who's saying, this is, this is science. A lot of conservatism. Okay, so in the 1920s, there was a big economic boom, right? One of the biggest booms in American history. Of course, it's going to be followed by one of the biggest busts in American history, the Great Depression in the 30s. The Secretary of State, his name was Andrew Mellon. 
and his tax policies favored the rich. He called it the trickle down effect that if we lower rich people's taxes, that they will open up more businesses, create jobs, and the money will trickle down. So the three Republican presidents of the 1920, we're going to talk about Harding, we're going to talk about Hoover, we're going to talk about Coolidge, Coolidge and then Hoover. Um, they, they really bought into that. Hey, give money to the rich people so they'll open up more business and the money will trickle down. Very Republican. Also, another reason for the economic boom was the automobile. Henry Ford, with his assembly line in Michigan, were producing one automobile every 10 seconds. And what does that cause? Well, people are out there, the more you buy, it's the Costco effect. The more you, the more you produce, the more people can buy, the price will go down. So more people are buying cars, more people are um, going on vacation and they're driving different places, they're going to the movie. So it's really stimulating the economy. And then 1920s was the, the first major advertisement, advertising push in history, right? They used, you know, seduction, they used, you know, money, they used sex appeal to sell merchandise. Sports, 20s, huge time for sports. People were spending money to go watch, you know, people like Babe Ruth and boxer Jack Dempsey. Um, so very, very, you know, football, baseball were big. Also credit, use, use a buy now and pay later, right? You using credit cards for the first time and then stock market mania. Big part of it was the stock market was going crazy. And we'll talk more about that. Let's get into the automobile here. Uh, Detroit was the automobile capital of the world because of Ford. Efficiency was the key with the assembly line where one guy would be responsible for putting the left front tire on by, you know, screwing in the lug nuts. That was his job all day long. And then he would do that and the car would be on this conveyor belt and it would be going very slow. It's enough time for him to put on the, the tire, put the lug nuts on, and then it was going to go on. The next car would come. He'd do the same thing. Very monotonous, very boring, but very efficient. The assembly line transformed um, automobile production, it's going to transform the economy in the United States, the booming 20s. Cars were made more affordable because of that, like I said, the Costco effect. Um, but it says here in 1929, when the market collapsed, when, when uh, you know, we started the Great Depression, 26 million motor vehicles were registered in the United States, or one car per 4.9 Americans. So we were driving ourselves to the poorhouse, basically. Many other industries benefited from the car. Think about it, rubber for the tires, the rubber industry, the glass industry for the windshields, the steel industry for the chassis of the car, oil for the production of gasoline, gasoline, cement for the roads, and then tourism. You know, people are just getting their car and they're going on vacation. So hotels and theme parks, things like that, big in the 1920s. There's uh, one of the first ever uh, automobiles, kind of, is Daimler and Maybach. And there's one of the uh, another one that's given credit in the United States for the first car was 1896, and uh, this was Henry Ford produced what what he called the quadricycle because um, it, it ran on four bicycle tires, and then eventually he, he evolved into uh, Ford, Motor, Ford Motor Company in 1903, and there's the famous Model T Ford. You have a crank in the front to start it up. You can see it right there. That's how they started it. The Model T. Henry Ford, he's, his, a famous quote is, I want to pay my workers so that they can afford my product. So you can see here the Model T as the uh, sale, as the price goes down, the sales go up. You could see here a spike in, between 1915 and 1919. And that's because of uh, the changeover from a peacetime economy to a wartime economy. So Ford was no longer producing Model Ts, but he was producing tanks and things like that for the war effort. So the automobiles that were out there, the price went up because of scarcity. And then after the war was over, they went back to making cars and the price went down and the sales went up. Here's a 1926 uh, runabout 
forward runabout. It says black all steel body, large compartment under the rear deck, weatherproof side curtains, <laughs> opening with both doors, uh, four cord tires, nickel head headlamp rims, windshield wiper, one windshield wiper, starter and demountable rims, $85 extra. Balloon tires with air, $25 extra. So they're actually start in 1926, starting to have starters inside the car as opposed to cranking it on the outside like the Model T. Here's one of the first car accidents in 1912. It's like that car, the two cars hit and maybe you know, hit something else. There's the assembly line, that's what it looked like. Here's a guy putting on the lug nuts of the front left tire. Take a look at that. This is a beach in Massachusetts. Hundreds of identical Fords jam the beach. And you can get, you can get a Ford automobile in any color as long as it was black. So you better know your license plates number because every single car look the same. All right, that's the end of part one.